Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. We're glad that you decided to join us today, and we're going to be continuing our series uh, on the book of John so that we will believe. And uh, today I I'm calling this message Important Meeting in a Humble Friend. And we're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 3 today. Um, and we're going to be looking at uh, Jesus having a conversation with uh, Nicodemus and uh, Jesus explaining the fact that, that he has come to be the Messiah. He's come to be uh, the one to bring eternal life, that the Father has sent him uh, not to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And, and so this is an incredibly important chapter. Um, you know, one, if, if, the, if it's not the most famous, it's, it's in the, the top five uh, verses in the scripture of John 3.16, um, talking about you know how we can be saved and in fact that what Jesus has done for us and so we're going to be taking a look at this but uh, you know before we start we need to take a look at, a little bit at, at the culture of what was going on because when we start we're going to see this this ruler of the Pharisees come, who, who comes uh, to talk to Jesus but he comes to him at night now you, we might not really think of this uh, a big thing. In fact, you know, you might do your entertaining in the evening time or that sort of stuff because, you know, we all work and and that sort of thing. And so, you know, you might do your your have company over and all this sort of stuff. But uh, in in the time Jesus time, this was a little bit of an odd thing. You know, you didn't typically go visiting uh, at night because this was, you know. This was if you wanted to do something in secret, if you didn't want people to know, if you weren't wanting to announce what you were doing. And that's kind of the situation that Nicodemus uh, was in is is uh, he knew um, that, that Jesus had to be from, from God because of the things that he did. Um, but there was many that was on the, the, the ruling council, many Pharisees and, and Sadducees who, who just already despised Jesus. Uh, didn't want anything to do with them that thought he was a troublemaker. And, you know, it's kind of important that, that Nicodemus is a little worried about public opinion and what's going on. And so we're going to be taking a look at this, um, and, and we're going to just sort of pull it apart piece by piece to see what, what the Lord has for us. And so let's let's start this morning by asking the Lord to bless our time together uh, that, that he will open his word and, and that we will get out of it what we should. Um, so, dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to take a look at your word. We pray, Lord, that you would just help us to hear uh, what you would have us to hear. Lord, that you would help us to see what you were trying to show Nicodemus. And, and Lord, also what, what uh, John the Baptist was trying to, to share about who you were. Um, as we get later on in this. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would open your word to us. Help us to see it for what it was intended to show. And, Lord, help us to learn the lessons. Lord, we just pray that you be with us, guide us, and direct us in this time we have together. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, amen. So, as we think about this, you know, do you have a situation where, where maybe maybe in your own walk with the Lord, um, the fact that you are a Christian is kind of a, a secret. It's kind of a, you know, I don't know if I want everybody to know and all this sort of stuff. You know, I found a, a, a cartoon that was done. It has basically these two characters dressed up like uh, secret service agents. And one of them backs up against the other one and says, Psst, are you a Christian? And the, the other one goes, yeah, says, yes, but no need to yell it. And... You know that that's kind of kind of the way sometimes I think some people are is is we are afraid to have people know that we are Christians. We we don't necessarily you know we're all about maybe going to church on Sunday, carrying our Bible and all this sort of stuff. But the rest of the week, we just want to blend in, and and you know that's a that's a little bit of a problem if we're trying to be super secret secret squirrel Christians and. You know, I think when we get to Nicodemus here, we're going to see that he kind of had this issue. Um, he sort of was a secret follower of Jesus. And, and, and you know, to be honest, we, we, really, we really cannot be a secret follower of Jesus. In fact, I, I think that the life that the Lord calls us to live um, would, would definitely say that, that we cannot be a secret follower. We're, we're, because we're supposed to be 
sharing the good news of who Jesus is. We're supposed to, people are supposed to be able to see Jesus in us. And so if, if it's super secret, the question is, are we, are we ashamed of our Savior? It says that, that you know, we should, we, we need to, to, to share and, and to say, because, you know, if, we, if we're ashamed of the Lord, he's, he's going to be ashamed of us. And that's kind of a, a scary thought, to be real truthful sometimes. But, you know, something we need to think about. As we look at this, uh, you know, there was a song that came out when I was a kid um, called uh, Jesus Freak. It was done by a group named DC Talk. And, and for some people, that's not their cup of tea type of music. But uh, I remember one of the, the lines that says, I don't care if you label me a Jesus Freak because there is no disguising the truth. And that, that's, that's kind of what we need to look at here when we see Nicodemus come um, because he was he was missing something pretty important uh, as far as his relationship with Jesus. So let's take a look. Let's go ahead. We're going to be in John chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 1 and 2. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And so Nicodemus comes. He, he comes at night. He, he's not really wanting to broadcast that he's coming to Jesus, but but he says, he he calls Jesus rabbi, he calls him teacher. Now this is, this is high praise coming from Nicodemus, who the rest of Israel calls him rabbi. And so he's, he's saying, hey, I, I know that you have to come from God because of these miracles, these signs that you do. There's no way you could do them unless God was with you. And, and so... He's, he sort of has an idea of at least that Jesus is from God, but he doesn't truly understand. We're going to see that Jesus is going to come and, and, and see Nicodemus where he is and get to the, the root of the matter here as we continue on verse 3 and 4. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? And so Jesus knows what he's looking for. Nicodemus is a very religious man. You know, I, I, I truly even think he might have been looking for the Messiah. I, I think that he was somebody that I don't know if he truly understood Jesus' mission, at least at this point. But, you know, at least for the fact that, that he's... He's uh, one of the ones that, that goes to ask for the Lord's body and make sure that it's buried properly and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I think he, he was somebody who was a follower. You know, I think that we have some hope uh, later on in Scripture when we see that uh, many of the priests and, and the, the religious leaders come to know the Lord as, as their Lord and Savior. Um, you know, I, I, I truly think that Nicodemus gets it in the end, but... But we see that Jesus is going to the heart of the matter. He's, he's like, you know, how can how can he have eternal life? How can he see the kingdom of God? This is this is the the question that is on the heart and the mind of Nicodemus. And so Jesus, he is very bold, and he addresses the issue right out of the gate and says, "Unless one is born again, you can, he cannot see the kingdom of God." And so Nicodemus is not looking at anything with spiritual eyes. He's, he's looking at anything physically, and he's like, you know, I'm an old man. How, how, can, how can I be born a second time? And he's asking Jesus, you know, do, you know I, I, I'm old. I, I, you know, how can I be born again from my mother's womb and all this sort of stuff? And we see, obviously, Nicodemus isn't getting it. He, he doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. And so Jesus is going to elaborate some more and, and tell him some more. And we see this in, going on in verse 5 through 8. It says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Uh, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. And so he, he, he sort of is, is laying this out there that, that you have to be born twice. And he says, 
you know, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's saying, you can, if, you're, if you're fleshly, you're, you're flesh. If you're spirit, you're spirit. But he's saying that you have to be born of water and spirit. So, so basically he's saying, like, there's two births here. That there's, there's a physical birth that everybody experiences, everybody that's alive. You know, we've experienced that physical birth. But then there's a spiritual birth. There is this spiritual life that has to be born, that has to, to take off. And he says, you know, Jesus said, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell from where it comes from, where it goes. So is it with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You know, when we think about it, you know, we, we, we think about the wind and stuff. You know, I've noticed as I've been up here in, in northwest Indiana, um, it is much windier up here than where I grew up in southern Indiana. Um, you know, southern Indiana, we had had days where the air would just stagnate and, and it would get super humid and all this sort of stuff. And you'd be in the summertime, it'd just be this horrible, sticky very uncomfortable feeling, but, you know, being up close to the lake and stuff, uh, Lake Michigan, there's almost always wind. And, and you, you can look outside and you can see the tree, you can see the, the trees and stuff, but, but if you look carefully, you can see the impact of the wind. You can see the branches move, the, the force, you know, you don't see it. You don't physically see the wind, but you can see its impact. You know, that's sort of the same thing when we think of, of somebody who, is, who has been born again, born spiritually, is they might not look a whole lot different on the outside. In fact, they probably don't. They, you know, we still look like that tree or whatever, but, but that wind on the inside, it, it's, it's moving, it, it's changing, it's, it, it has impact. And, and, you know, when we think of our, our life and, and how we should be spiritually, you know, that that new life that we have in Christ should be impacting our life. It should be changing how we how we deal with things, how we we behave. It should be we should be looking more and more like Jesus all the time. And so there's this force, this this spiritual force, this thing that is working on us and changing us and making us look different. Um, and, and so he's he's trying to explain this to him. Now, well, you know. It, that's a pretty good uh, example. You know, Nicodemus, he, he wasn't he wasn't getting it. He wasn't understanding. You know, I, I want to read you this uh, this little snippet here out of my study Bible. Um, it says, uh, words for wind and spirit come from the same Greek word, uh, pneuma. No one can see the wind in which it is blowing, only its effects. Sim similarly, no one can see the, the new birth happening as a result of the Spirit's life-changing work or evident. And, and so, so yeah, it, it is, it is this change that is happening on the inside. And so he's trying to explain this. Nicodemus isn't getting it, but as we look here, he's going to share another example with Nicodemus. So we, we continue on verse nine. He says, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most surely I say to you. We speak what we know, and we testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Now, this is kind of interesting as, as he's putting this. He's saying that, you know, we speak to what we know, what we've seen, and he's saying, you know, I'm trying to tell you earthly things to explain spiritual matters, but you're not getting it. Verse 12, if I told you earthly things and you did not believe, how will you believe I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the son of man who is in he who is in heaven, and uh, who who is in heaven. You know, what does this mean? Well, he, he's saying that, you know, I've got to use these earthly examples to help you understand spiritual things. Because if I tell you spiritual things, if I tell you the things of heaven, you've never seen it, you've never experienced it. How are you going to grasp? You know, a good way that I, I've I've tried to to think about this is. Is think if you had somebody that was isolated and has never seen uh, an airplane or never seen a helicopter or something, and you're trying to explain it to them. Um, you know, maybe maybe you would use the you know a, a phrase or something. You would try to tell them, well, well, uh, uh, an airplane's like a big metal bird, and you know the the image they might have in their their 
their imagination is this giant thing that's flapping its wings and stuff. And it's like, no, it doesn't flap its wings. It, it's, but it's, 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 and, you know, think about how would you explain something that they've never seen before that they, they didn't have a grasp of, you know, if you said it was this, this giant metal container and it just goes up in the sky, I mean, you might think, you know, it's, they might think of metal and they, they drop it and it's like this heavy, chunk and how is this going to fly and and you know this is what jesus is trying to say if i if i tell you of heavenly things how are you going to understand so i'm telling you of earthly things he says the only one that's seen the things of heaven and and and, and that is is the son of man who's been in heaven so then he's going and he's going to shift gears a little bit and he's going to give an example out of the old testament that that Nicodemus is sure to know. He says, verse 14, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, he, Nicodemus would have been very aware of, of the serpent in the wilderness. You know, uh, the people of Israel, had this was when they were wandering, and they had rebelled against God, and God sent these, these snakes, and it bit them. And it was excruciatingly painful, and, and God told Moses to, to make this brass serpent, and he put it on pole, and to, to set it in front of the people. And if the people would just turn and look to the image of the snake, that the snake bite they received would not kill them, that they would, they would recover, and that they would be all right. And, and you know, the, the sad thing was... Is that I don't I don't think I, I don't believe that everybody looked. I, I think there were some people that were stubborn and died because they wouldn't look to this this serpent. But he's saying that, you know, Jesus is saying that so even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know, whoever looked at that serpent, they recovered from the snake bite, but they still were going to die. It says, whoever is, it looks upon the Son of Man, whoever whoever looks upon him as he is lifted up, will will have eternal life, that they'll live forever. And so he's 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 telling Nicodemus, hey, I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. I, that people are, if they look to what I've done there, if they look to the sacrifice that I'm giving, that they will have eternal life. And so he's spelling out to Nicodemus everything that he's come to do, but Nicodemus isn't getting it. He isn't understanding. So let's let's continue on and see see how how Jesus explains this in a little bit more detail. And so we get to John three sixteen. It says, "For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him." might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so when we think about this, you know, I, I seen a commentator who said, and I really like this, is when we look at the John 3.16, it says, for God so loved the world. And we sort of think of so as, as, as he loved us so much in, in such a huge thing. But he had an idea is, is maybe it's saying this is how God, this God loved the world this way. So this is how he did it by sending Jesus. They gave his only begotten son, that that's how he showed his love, that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, that God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, we were already condemned by our sin and that's why verse 18 says, he who uh, believes on him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. We are already condemned. We are, we are dead in our sins. That because of our sin, we cannot be, God cannot be in our presence. We cannot be in his. And, and so if we, if we do not do something about our sin problem, or something, somebody doesn't do something on our behalf, we are hopeless already. And so he said, God sent his son. He loved us in this manner that he sent his son, that whoever would believe in him would, would not perish but have everlasting life. Just like that, that serpent that was raised up in the wilderness, Jesus is going to be raised up in that if we would look upon him, if we would, would identify with his sacrifice, if we would 
you know, appreciate this gift that is given to us that we would not perish, that we would have eternal life, that this this is the the greatest news, the best news that has ever been given. This is this is the the culmination of the promise that was given all the way back to Eve in the Garden of Eden that that you know between the serpent and the the woman that one of her seed would would crush the serpent's head and that the serpent would bruise his heel. You know, this is this is what it's talking about. You know that that Jesus was going to defeat Satan that, that Jesus was going to finish and, and conquer this this sin debt that has separated God's greatest creation from himself that it was going to be paid for and so we see this but but we also see that that God says that if, if we do not believe we're condemned already you know there is there is a person I've I've seen on the internet that that said you know well if I don't believe in God and stuff and and he doesn't want to send anyone to hell then if I just don't believe in him, then he can't send me. And it's like, that's not true. The fact of the matter is, is that God has created. And if we, we have a choice, if we want nothing to do with Jesus, if we want nothing to do with the, the forgiveness of our sins, if we don't want to be separate from God, then there's only one place that he can put us for eternity where we are separate from him. And that, unfortunately, is hell. That is that is the lake of fire, because that is the only place that God's presence is not. And so, when we think about this, it is it is it is the person and their decision that is is determining their eternity. Because if they say, "I want nothing to do with God," then God puts them where He is not, so they have nothing to do with Him. It's those that say, "Lord, I I I need help. I can't do this. I I need you." is we, we reach out to him, he reaches back to us. That he's already paid the debt. You know, see, we the, the thing of it is, is, is we're never truly alive until we're born again. We may be physically alive, but spiritually we are dead. We, we're like zombies. You know, we're just sort of aimlessly going through this life. We are, we are condemned. We're this monster. It's not until we're made spiritually alive that we are, we are truly people, that we are truly... His people, because he doesn't just forgive us of our sins. He, by what Jesus did on the cross, he, had, he we are adopted into God's family. That we are Jesus' brothers and sisters, and, and, and that we are, we are put into the very family of God, and that is amazing and awesome, and and just is is such a wonderful thing. But let's continue because it says verse nineteen, and this is the condemnation. This is. This is how the, the condemnation happens. That the light is coming to the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But when but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. You know, it really is the fact that it, those that, that are... are what nothing to do with God? It is there is there is there is some some impact that the Word of God has. How do I explain this? Well, put it this way: Think about uh, the newspaper when you read the newspaper. If if somebody says something against one of the other gods or one of the religions, it's it's this horrible, terrible thing. How dare they, you know, mock Muhammad or how dare they? say something against Buddha or something of that nature. And we have, you know, everybody come, comes riding to their defense that we have, we have freedom of religion and you can't say that. But when somebody makes fun of a Christian, well, that's just, that's just funny. And, and that's okay because the reason is, is this world, you know, the story of Jesus, the story of what he's done for us, uh, that God created, we are, we are in desperate need of him. It reaches to somebody's soul. It says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. You know, it, it it impacts people. And the fact of the matter is, is there's so many people that they want nothing to do with, with God and that. They they want to stay away from it. And so they are making their choice. And that is that is sad. 
that they want to stay away from the light when the light is the thing that can heal them and bring them forgiveness. So as we continue on in, in John chapter 3, we, we see a shift. Um, we, we, we've sort of finished this conversation with Nicodemus. You know, I don't think he truly got it, but, but the, the, Jesus put this out there that we can, we can see it and we can experience it ourselves and, and understand what he came to do. And then the fact that it is through him that we can have forgiveness. But then John the Baptist, we see this in starting in verse 22, um, he is going to give a testimony of who Jesus is. And it is, it is beautiful. It's, it's him being very humble. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from him. So verse 22, it says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judah, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing in Anon, near Salem, because there is much water there. And they came, they came and were baptized, for John had not been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear, uh, bear me witness. I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. And the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. And so we see this, this time now, now other other passages will say that, uh, you know, Jesus wasn't baptizing. It was his disciples that were baptizing. But uh, basically they were they were telling the, the good news of what Jesus was coming. He was telling about the the kingdom of heaven. He was sharing with people and preaching. And so there was, they were baptizing in, in John's followers and even the, the local people were not coming to John as much. They were going to Jesus and they were hearing from him. And, and some of John's followers were saying, you know, John, what, what's going on? You know, you don't have the crowds anymore. And, and this guy who you, you bore witness to that, that he was the lamb of God and he, you know, everybody's going to him. And, and so what's, what's going on with that? And, John answered, said, basically, I only got what the Lord gave me. You know, I, there's nothing that I could have without him. He, he gave this to me. And he says, I, I, you heard me say, and I told that I am not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the one that you should be looking for. I'm just the one that came before him to prepare the way. You know, he says, the one that has the bride is the bridegroom. Now, the, we know later on, we see this, this, uh, depiction many times that the bride is is the church is is the people that that come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior the those that follow after him this is the the bride of Christ and he who has the bride is the bridegroom and it's the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears his voice is, is has rejoices greatly he's the best man is excited that his buddy is getting married and you know that's what John came to do is is he is He's getting things ready. He's setting the stage for, for the bridegroom to come for his bride. And, you know, he is he has fulfilled his his mission, and that's why he says this this joy of mine is fulfilled. I, I have I have done that. I have I have prepared and I am excited and I've shared and I've witnessed. And then he says, He must increase, but I must decrease. You know, this is one of probably the most important lessons that we can learn. You know, as far as understanding our relationship with the Lord is, you know, when we come to Jesus, he wants us to re just the way we are. He we don't have to fix ourselves. We don't have to try to get ourselves right. We don't have to try to figure out some way where we stop sinning before we come to the Lord. But the Lord does not want to leave us that way. He doesn't want us to stay exactly how we were. He's wanting to char change us and make us more and more like him. And so as we do that, we need to become less like us, less like the sinful, broken us, and more and more like Jesus as we, we learn and we reflect and he makes us more like him. And this is what John says is he's got to increase, I've got to decrease. You know, people need to quit following me. They need to follow him because he is the Messiah. He is the one 
He is the one that has come, the, the one that was foretold. He is the one who God had sent to make things right. And so we see this, this wonderful witness of what he was saying. But John isn't done there. Now let, let's finish up this chapter. Verse 31, he says, He who comes, uh, he comes from above is above all, and he who is of earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He's saying, I know he comes from above. I, I'm, I'm, of, I'm of earth, and I'm speaking of earthly things. He comes from heaven. He's speaking of, of greater things. He is above all. He says he's testifying, but no one's, receive, no one's, no one's hearing him. No one's understanding what he's saying. It says, he who, who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Verse 33. 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. Now this is, this is the thing that's really cool here. Verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. John got it that, that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, we, we see in the other Gospels when, when John baptized him and he brought him out of the water, he saw the, the Spirit of, of God come down as a dove and rested upon Jesus. And then, then they heard the voice of God say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And he's saying, God has given his son everything. It's all been put into his hands. He that believes in him is going to have everlasting life, but he who does not believe in him shall not see life. Like I, like I said, you know, we're we're zombies. We we don't have life until we we are born again. You know, we may live, we may be physically alive, but you know, if we don't understand that we need forgiveness of our sins, we need we need Jesus. We are missing it. And, you know, it is so sad, but so many people go through life and they, they live only for themselves. They're here in just the flash of a flash on the pan, blink of an eye, uh, the like the grass in the field. It, it's there, it's beautiful, and it withers and dies. We need Jesus. The testimony is he came and he showed and, and he came to forgive us of our sins. And if we would reach out to him, we would have eternal life. That we wouldn't have to worry about what comes next. Because what comes next is so much better than what we have now. But it requires faith and belief. The question to us is, how are we going to respond to Jesus? Are we going to look at Jesus and see what he came to do? And we're going to say, yes, Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Jesus has done exactly what he says he's going to do. And we believe and we put our faith in him we trust him. Or are we going to look at him and say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. He's a myth. He's, he's this. He's that. You know, I think there is so much evidence that Jesus was truly real. That the miracles he did was real. The things that, that we have in the scripture is absolutely true, both in the word and outside of the word. That I think the choice is so easy, but it comes down to, do you believe? How are you going to respond to Jesus? Are you going to come to him and say, I need you, Lord? Or are you going to say, I don't want anything to do with you? That is the first of the two questions, what is the meaning of life? And it's the, the first one. You have to answer that one before the next question comes up. And so the question is to you, what are you going to do with Jesus? Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I hope that you got something out of our, our look at John chapter 3. Um, we're going to come back this next week. We're going to be in John chapter 4 and 5. There's going to be a few of these weeks I'm going to have to put... Um, some chapters together for us to be able to get through and, and get to where we need to uh, for Resurrection Day. Um, but I hope that this is going to be a blessing to you in this series. And if you are somebody who's never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and you want to know more about it, please give me a call here at Calvary. 
um, or or let or talk to one of your 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 Christian friends or or just message us or or comment on the the YouTube video here and we will get back with you. I'd love to be able to talk with you and answer any questions that you have because that is the most important question that you will ever deal with is how are you going to respond to Jesus? Well, thank you so much for being here. Hope that you have a great and wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. God bless.